Hey, good morning. Oh, you guys have had coffee today, I can tell. Hey, it's great to be here with you. My name is Steve Klemp. I'm the pastor here at Love of Christ. We love that you're joining us here in person. For those of you online, we love you guys too. You're joining us from wherever it is. We love that you are taking time out of your day, or maybe it's even sometime later on in the week or, or later on in the month. It could be September when you're watching this. That's all right. We, and you guys, if you missed something, if you'd have missed a note or something, you want to watch it again, you can do that. We archive our sermons uh, out there. So if you miss anything today, uh, or would like to forward this to somebody, if this is a message that you think uh, a friend of yours would, would care to hear about, um, you can do that. And it's an awesome thing. Technology is amazing what we can do uh, with that. <clears throat> uh, we brought a book. If you guys grabbed a book, this is a great time. If you've not grabbed a book uh, about the attitudes. You can do that. Now, if you like to take notes, this is a great thing to uh, take with you uh, today. Uh, We are going to be taking a look. We're getting towards the end of the book, okay? We're almost done. Next Sunday uh, is actually the last uh, the last day we'll be using this book. But we'd love for you to take notes, but also we'd love for you to take this home uh, and, and look at some of the additional scripture passages. Take, take a Bible study, dig into what the messages that are happening here on Sunday, and take it into your week. Uh, because that's really what this is. What, what we do on Sunday morning is great, but if it doesn't apply or doesn't hit us on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, okay, then, then we're missing something. Because this is, this is meant for us as we gather on Sundays to go and, and to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to take God's love with us into the world, into our everyday lives. And so we pray that this is something uh, that can help you do that. You know, we've had um, just an awesome uh, experience, I think, with, with the Beatitudes, wrestling with these. And um, <clears throat> what, when we put these sermon series together, um, oh, man, there's a lot of heads that go around on this and we work on it. And I just wanted to give you some encouragement. I know uh, some of you guys are a little anxious about what's happening uh, with love of Christ in the future. Uh, in two weeks, it'll be my last Sunday here with all of you. It's hard to believe that it's, it's already here. Um, I, I love you guys. I'm going to miss you. But I want to encourage you. Okay, in the last couple of weeks that I have with you, I want to encourage you that God is on the move. God has a plan for you. There, there are people in, in leadership positions here at Love of Christ, from our leadership council uh, to our board of elders to our staff. You have an awesome group of leaders who are seeking after the heart of God. And, and I just uh, keep them in your prayers. Okay, uh, but also I want to let you know if you want to be a part of the next chapter of Love of Christ. Okay, I encourage you really to pray about it, to think about it. Uh, because when, when we're talking about this thing called, uh, we're forming a call committee, okay, to, to look and search, if you want to think of it maybe as a search committee for the next pastor here at Love of Christ. Uh, we're going to get to a, a group together, maybe a half dozen or so people, who are really going to do some hard work behind the scenes, getting um, names of pastors, interviewing pastors, right? Uh, maybe bringing them on site, showing hospitality to them, uh, that we can figure out who the next leader here is. If you would like to be a part of that, after prayerful consideration, again, because there's, there's kind of a, there's a commitment here, because this is hard work, okay? I'm just going to warn you. It's pretty hard work. It's, it's a commitment. You can go to loveofchrist.org slash call. There's, there's a form out there. You can fill that out. And you go, Pastor Steve, I'm not that technically uh, uh, advanced, you know, uh, that darn technology. I just don't do it. Uh, that's okay. We have paper forms too, okay? So you can grab a paper form today. Think about it. Pray about it. Fill that out. We're going to have a... a, a a box we can deposit those into. So if you like the paper form, you can do that. If you're watching online, if you're here in person, you want to do it, uh, you can do that through uh, this website. And I know uh, that God's going to get the right team of people together to search. Uh, I don't know how long. I wish I could tell you. Uh, the new pastor is going to be installed, you know, 2024 uh, in July. No, I, I can't tell you that. But I know in the process, in the searching, great things uh, can happen and great growth is there. So uh, I have great confidence, maybe you don't, uh, but I have great confidence in the people that are here and your heart and your passion for the ministry here at Love of Christ. And so um, I just want to encourage you to, to think and pray about that involvement. All right, back to the Beatitudes. Let's get started. But before we jump in, whew, let's pray. Would you guys pray with me? Let's go before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great and amazing love. Thank you for all the blessings that you shower upon me every day. And Lord, we just ask that you would bring your peace, the peace of your presence here today. Block out, Lord, all of the distractions that we have, the 
the to-do lists, the other things that we want to do before Monday morning, but help us just focus in on your word. May your spirit flow through our hearts today, uh, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, yes, amen. Very good. <clears throat> I'll be coming back over here later for more amens. That'll be great. The Beatitudes. All right, we're finishing up. Uh, actually, there's a section, there's this there, there's a, there's components of the Beatitudes. So the Beatitudes are just, it, Beatitude is just a fancy word for blessed or blessed. Uh, we've talked about, if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, it, it's a favored position or it's a, a position of contentment, uh, especially in the midst of chaos. That, that's, that's what we're, we're kind of really looking at, and especially today when we're talking about peacemakers. But we get these Beatitudes from Matthew chapter five. This is Jesus. It's kind of the beginning of his most famous sermon. Um, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about these blessed statements, and he puts them out, and he, he and it's called the Sermon on the Mount because he goes up and he preaches this on a mountain uh, to to a bunch of people who who are sitting there listening to him, and he finally gets to this point. And so the, all of the beatitudes leading up to this, okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are those who mourn, bless all all of those blessed statements are are talking about uh, a Christian character or aspect. And, and they kind of, if they build on each other, this is the last one, okay? This peacemaker one is kind of the last one of the Christian character. Then we're going to shift next, next week, we're going to shift into some of the other things of what does it mean when you're trying to be a Jesus follower and some of the challenges that that can, that can pose. Uh, but here, here's it is. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of of God. And what's interesting is the word peace is used over 400 times in the Bible. In fact, it's used in every single book of the New Testament, except for one, <laughs> First John. For some reason, First John doesn't, doesn't have the word peace in there, but First John's all about love and the nature of God and everything, so we'll, we'll, give, we'll give that one a pass. But you see how important this word of peace is. The shalom sometimes in the, in the Old Testament is this, is this peace, the, the greeting of peace. The angels bring peace. Whenever they show up, they say, do not be afraid. I bring a message of peace. <laughs> uh, or Jesus, after his resurrection, right? He, he shows up to his disciples and they're terrified. And they're like, ah, and he goes, peace be with you. All right. So this idea of peace is something I think that we, we all want and we all need. And it's something, it's such a, critical concept when you're reading in scripture. Yet what's really fascinating is the word peacemaker is only used once in the whole Bible. It's only used one time. There's a fancy word, it's called a hapax legomenon, all right? You're like, what is that? It just means it's only said once, all right? It's only said once in the entirety of scripture. 400 times for the word peace, once for peacemaker it's, it's a combination of words kind of smashed together, like we would say maker and peace. We see how those two words come together, but it's only put together like this one time. And Jesus says it. Right. So 400 times a piece, Jesus says one word, peacemaker. They're like, whoa, that, that to me goes, whoa, my antenna go up. And I'm like, what is happening here? Because this is something different than, than the other times that Jesus says, peace be with you, or I'm, I'm going to give you peace. Peacemaker looks at it and, and talks about what it takes, perhaps, to get peace. And really, ultimately, peace takes effort. Peace doesn't just happen naturally, right? Chaos, discord, disagreements, relationship breakdowns, those things, those things happen naturally. Right? We, can, we can take a look at that in, in Scripture. As soon as sin enters the world, Genesis chapter Three in Genesis chapter four we have the first murder. Okay, one chapter later there's already murder. There's there's sibling rivalry already happening. That's the natural flow of what sin does and is. And so this is an important concept I want you to to, to take in today. Peace is not something you hope for; it's something you work for. All right? Peace is not something you hope for. You can't just sit on your hands and go, "Well, I hope it gets better." I'm like, I hope peace comes. You know, that's, it's, it's not going to happen. It's something that ha requires work. Because whenever there's, there's a breakdown of peace, there's, there's usually two, at least two sides that there's something they're butting heads over. 
And, and you can say, well, I'm just not going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to agree to disagree and, and walk away. Well, you haven't really established peace in that. It, you, you, you've left this, this thing, there's a thing that's created in the, in the conflict, right? And you just kind of left it there and go, well, I'm not, in, I'm not going to engage in that. Just because you don't engage in the conflict doesn't mean there's, there's peace, okay? That, that's, that's something you hope for. Well, I hope that maybe goes away. I hope I sweep it under the rug and then somebody else might clean up that mess. That's kind of how a lot of people approach peace because it's hard work and it's uncomfortable. And I think this is why Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers because he knows making peace isn't, isn't easy. Take a look at what it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. Now, Paul is talking about a, a Christian community, right? A, a gathering together. And, and as I read this, I was like, oh, man, this is my prayer for love of Christ starting in September when I'm not here, okay? I'm going to really encourage you guys because I know people are going to have all kinds of different opinions about, about the next leader here, and, and there's going to be challenges. And, and I just pray that you would make every effort, all right? to keep the unity of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is alive and active and moving here. It's so awesome to see what the Spirit does. But see, it takes effort, doesn't it? It takes effort to go back to, to God's leading, God's guiding, God's directing. And this is the bond of peace that we have together as fellow Jesus followers. But even more than just the, the family of God, look what the author of Hebrews says. He says this, Make every effort, oh, whoa, very similar uh, to what we just read. Make every effort to live in peace, not just with the family of God, with everyone, and to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We talked about that uh, yesterday, or last week, right? You, you have to be able to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the Lord. Here's another one. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But look at that. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone around you. It's not an easy thing to do because our world is in conflict. Yes, can I, can I get an amen over there again? An amen, yeah. Our world is, is in conflict. It's, it's awful. I, just the, the amount of time, I mean, you don't think the world's in conflict. Just wait for the next election cycle, all right? Oh my goodness, wow. We have some challenges. We got some problems. I remember when I was a pastor at my previous congregation in Rockford, I had just gotten there and they had told me, they said, oh, pastor, we're glad you're here. Uh, our, our church just had like two feet of water in the basement because the flood channel just north of the church flooded last summer. And, and here you're, uh, you're here. We can, we can move on. We're going to charge forward into the future. I said, yeah, let's go. And then in August, it flooded again. I'm like, no, what are we doing? And here we were with a, with a boat of a church, right? <laughs> like trying to keep the water out and, and trying to figure out, like, what do we do as a congregation? Do we run away from this problem, uh, which is a, a poorly designed or, well, it was originally a, a well-designed flood channel that now no longer serviced the amount of people uh, and, and businesses and development that was happening further east. Do we, do we, re, do we relocate the congregation or do we stay here? And their decision was to stay in, in the community, in the neighborhood. It was a neighborhood model church. There were houses all around us. Uh, there, was a, there was a nice park right across the street from us. And the neighbors, as you can imagine, were really hot. They were really upset because their houses had gotten flooded twice in 11 months. And the church is like, yeah, we're right there with you. We got flooded twice in 11 months as well. And, and I remember one of the neighbors came up to me. He goes, hey, we're forming an association, a group, and, and we want to know if we can have a meeting in the church. I'm like, well, sure, community engagement, of course, as a pastor. I'm going to say yes. I say, yeah, come on in. That'd be great. What I didn't know is they were inviting uh, members of the city, uh, and in particular, one, one man who is the city water supervisor, um, and they invited him to the meeting too. So I remember sitting up at the, at the front table, with, with him and another representative from the city. Um, 
and a hundred angry neighbors, right? They were in the basement of the church. And I'm like, oh no, what did I do? I stepped right into this conflict. I didn't even know. I was trying to make things better. And here it was. I thought for sure we were going to have a riot. They didn't have pitchforks, but I imagine that they did, you know. They were going to burn the place down, right? It was just crazy. Oh, have you ever been in a situation like that where you're like, you get caught in between people who are really angry and, and you're like, listen, I just, you know, I just opened the door. I'm sorry. I did not mean to step into this. And this is oftentimes a situation we end up in, isn't it? In, in, in these conflicts, and these people around us raging and angry at each other. And most of us probably just want to go, whoop, I'm, I'm not involved. This is not my problem. I'm out. But what's very interesting is I've, I've walked with God over the last half century or so. Uh, I found out that whenever there's conflict, there's an opportunity for peace. There's an opportunity for peace to come in and change the situation. Not by hoping for it. It's got to work. You got to work towards it. But we cannot work towards peace if... Right? This is really important. We cannot work towards peace. We're not going to have, cannot help other people work towards peace if we don't have peace ourselves. If you are a chaotic sort of person or you've got a lot of things going on in your life or you've just got all kinds of things bubbling up in the surface, it's going to be impossible for you to bring peace to another situation because you're just going to bring your chaos, your turmoil into that situation. You're just going to add it to the mix and it's not going to help. Okay? And so if we're going to be peacemakers, we first have to find our peace. We have to establish where do we find our peace? Where can we make peace? Where is it in our own lives that there's, there's turmoil? Where is it that, that things are off kilter? As I've encountered people and, and, and they're not at peace, oftentimes I'll say, say, yeah, you can see that they're unsettled. Maybe they're, just, they're quick to rage or, or, or they just lash out at people. It's just not acting maybe rationally. You're like, why would you even poke that bear, right? And you ask them what the problem is, and they'll tell you. And you're like, okay, I'll try and solve that problem. But really, the truth is something deeper. To, to dig down to get at what, what is causing us unrest is usually pretty deep-seated. We'll, we'll take all the surface things, the easy answers, but really what's, what's down inside is there something wrong? There's something that we can't be at peace with. And that's where I believe that the only way that peace can come into our own hearts is through Jesus. That, that, that's, that's the thing, because Jesus took the ultimate unrest from our hearts, and he took care of that problem. It's called sin. Right? He takes care of that sin. And probably one of the deepest things that, that just causes us ultimate just stress is the fact that all of us, at one point in time or another, will die. Right? I mean, isn't that the, the, one of the biggest fears? There's two, two great fears in, in life. That's public speaking and death. So um, somehow, somehow I've overcome the public speaking thing. Although there are times where I'm just whew, sweating bullets. But it's only by the grace of God, right, that anybody would ever step up here. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's only by God's grace because I cannot be at peace with the things that I have done in my life. I've done some horrible things. I've said stupid things. Uh, I've, I've done things that I wish I could go back and change and do it differently. Right? I have all kinds of things in my mind where, man, if I could replay that situation, I would do it in a different way whether it was with my kids, losing my anger, frustration, not taking the time to spend with them. I, you know, I know my, my youngest two are, are 18. They're about to head off into college. And I'm like, man, I didn't do enough, right? Like, oh, shoot. I remember that one time when, when they wanted to play and I said, no, I can't. I've got, a, I've got a meeting or I've got something else going on. Or I just kind of pushed them off to the side. And I'm like, ah, you know, you don't, you hear it all the time, parents. You don't get that time back, but you don't really realize what you missed. Or maybe those opportunities until you reflect back on life. You're like, ah, oh, I got all this hurt and I got all this stuff jumbled up inside of me. And until and unless I take that and give that over to Jesus, I really can't find peace. 
Because Jesus didn't just hope for peace, right? God didn't just go, well, I hope the people come back and repent and come back to me. No, he earned our peace. Jesus worked for him. He came and through death on the cross, suffering and dying, bleeding for you and me, Jesus earned our peace. Look what it says in John 3, 16, right? Maybe that's why it's such a beloved Bible verse because God didn't hope for peace. He goes and he says, I'm going to establish it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him or whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the ultimate statement for peace. And the ultimate The ultimate thing that really gets us is when we are in a disagreement, right? When when our relationship with God is broken. And here it is. This is where when our relationship with God can be restored, that's the only source of true peace in this entire world. It's right there on the cross. That's why we put this huge cross here to remind us every time we come into the sanctuary, oh, that's where my peace comes from. Oh yeah, Jesus restored my relationship, right? That's, that's where I'm going to, uh, that's where I'm going to go because I know the person I am, but God sees me differently. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17 there, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All the stuff in the past, all the things that I get so embarrassed by, reflecting upon, I feel ashamed of. I'm like, oh man, that was such a boneheaded maneuver. That's gone. And it's a new creation. But Paul doesn't stop here. Look at this. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. See, this new creation isn't about me trying to make myself new or better. It, it's, it's there and that's where I have that peace that's, that's where I can say, oh, you know, I'm going to trust, I'm going to lean on God because he has done. And I'm not going to hope for peace. I'm going to look to the one who worked it for me. Right? That, that, that it's not something I hope for. It's something, right, something I'm going to work for. And, and the work that I do isn't that I'm earning my salvation. Okay, you got to stop that. There's, there's nothing I do. The work I do is every day I got to look to the cross and go, ooh, I need to be a new creation. I, every day, the, the effort, I read the, read the Bible and go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through the Bible. If you've been joining us through reading through the Bible for a year, oh man, it's been unbelievable. We just got through the book of Isaiah, just started Jeremiah. Talk about conflict, talk about uh, difficulty, and then talk about God's love, grace, and peace at the end of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah's comfort, comfort my people, right? Bring peace. It's like, oh man, this is amazing. And now we rewind and we go back and Jeremiah's going to go through almost the same thing. We're like, okay, Jeremiah's going to talk about conflict and, and challenges and, and God just wanting to be at peace with his people. So the, the work we do is to continually go back to God's peace that he has worked for us to remember our baptism. And this peace is something unique. Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 14, he goes, this peace I give you, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give, with, give you. And he says, I, and this verse continues on, he says, I don't give you like the world gives, okay? <laughs> this, is, this isn't a peace that's just sort of a, a truce that you sign on a piece of paper and hopefully you don't attack, uh, two countries don't attack each other for a while. Uh, that's not true peace. He says, this peace I give you just fills you up. Right? And it wipes everything out. And so really, when it, when it comes down to it, the only obstacle, there's only one obstacle to, to peace. It's pride. Because whenever we come and we, we, we come to God and God goes, okay, come to me uh, and, and I'll take all your sins. You got you to confess them to me. I'll, I'll take them away. And I'm gonna, in its place, I'm going to give you peace. And you go, well... Okay, but, <laughs> Sydney said, but to God. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. Uh, don't agree with you, but I'll listen. But I want, I want to keep doing this thing I'm doing over here, right? And God's like, no, you got, you got to give it all. Like, God's in control. And, and if we have any slice of pride in us, we're not going to find peace. Well, actually, we could find peace. So I'll give you one, one example. I was thinking about this. I said, you know, I have solved the world's problems. 
I don't know if you guys knew this, okay? I solved the world's problems because I know exactly how we would have 100% peace throughout the world, okay? All, everyone in the world, all 7, 8 billion people, right? All they have to do is agree that I'm 100% right and just give me the power, right? Totally fine. You guys, it'll be fine. It'll be great. We'll be totally at peace, right? No, we won't because we'll disagree at some point. And you go, well, I'm going to submit, but I'm not really going to agree with him, all right? And, and we're going to have discord. It, it never works. Have you ever seen a, a totalitarian dictatorship really work in peace? They almost always end in conflict, in turmoil, in, in coups, right? Because it never works. Because the dictator eventually, the king, whomever, however it works, will eventually think about themselves first and not the other people. And so that's what pride is. I come before you. It always infects. It's, it's really the base root of every single sin is pride. We're pushing God out of the way. We say, God, I know how to do this. You step over there. And yet God looks at us, rebellious, prideful people, and he says, I still love you. I still come for you. I, I want you to have peace and re- restore that relationship. Reconcile. He said, be a peacemaker. To step in and be a peacemaker, there already has to be conflict. I don't know if you realize that. You can't be a peacemaker when there's no conflict. Peacemakers step into the conflict and say, I'm going to now change this situation, this broken relationship. I'm going to reconcile the parties that are involved. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came in and he reconciled our hearts to God's. And if we're going to have peace today, if we're going to be able to be peacemakers, we have to have peace today. And if we're going to do that, we need God to bring his peace to us. Would you guys, would you guys confess your sins with me right now? Let's, let's just go to God right now. Let's just get rid of this garbage so that we can find that peace and then we can go forward. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you that you actively have been working towards our reconciliation with you. We, even in the midst of our, of our pride, our ridiculousness, our, our arrogance, Lord, that, that we have said, thought, and done things that, that we've really tried to push you and other people away. For all of that and even more, Lord, we, we just, we hand that over to you. We put that in your hands. We ask that that for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, you would wash us clean. Make us a new creation today, Lord. And where there is discord, Lord, put in your peace. Where there is unrest, Lord, put in your peace. We just pray this all in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, as we think about what God's great and amazing love, he promises that if we go to him, he will forgive his sins. That's what Jesus was. He was the ultimate peacemaker. And in coming into this planet, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for your sins and mine, he's made that peace between us and God. And so it's a great privilege to be with you, to tell you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's only from working from a place of peace that we can be peacemakers. You know, in Rockford, after that, after that, that riotous or near riotous meeting with the neighborhood association, uh, we had another one the next month. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't quite as lively. And then another one and another one. And as we kept on walking with, with our, our neighbors, they found us, the church, to be a place where there was peace. They, they might have had challenges in their lives and whatever, but the people would come to that neighborhood association meeting. They would come once a month and they'd be like, you know what? I just like being here. Everybody's welcoming. They, they, they love on me. And, and together from that place of peace, we were able to, to work together. And the, the, the neighbors were, were angry at the city and, and the church was kind of caught in the middle. I, I didn't think that I was gonna be like, oh good, I'm gonna go in there and be a peacemaker. And yet through the course of things and walking with the neighbors, I said, you know, here's the thing, guys. We can make the city our enemy and then we're going to constantly fight them. Or we can try to work together and figure out what the real problem is and to solve some other problems as well. Crime rate was going up in the neighborhood and all of these other challenges. 
And all of a sudden, that little flip and seeing the other person, the other, the other group, the other entity as the enemy instead of a potential ally, it changed everything. We wouldn't have been able to do that if we weren't in a, in a place of peace and in confidence that, that God's love was there, that God had put us in that position for, for that time. And as I look back on it, I was like, wow, God, that was amazing. You, you enabled us to be peacemakers in this situation. And that neighborhood group was able to do some amazing things in cleaning up crime and taking back the park. Right? People were afraid to take their kids to the playground when we were first involved in this whole situation. And it changed the whole nature of the interaction between that group and, and the city. And the church was there bringing and making that difference, being that peacemaker. We want to be a peacemaker first and foremost. If you have peace, find that peace first and then share, share that peace. Don't be afraid to be that peacemaker that steps into those situations that are really hard and really tough with open ears, listen. You, you got to get dirty. You got to get in there. You got to figure out. Seek understanding. Don't, don't bring the solution before you know what the problem is, okay? You got to be there and listen. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, you know, if you're going to do that, you need to make sure you get rid of all of that garbage, that rage, anger, bitter, bitterness, spite. And he's like, you can't have that because that's not a peaceful person. Instead, this is what he says, be kind and compassionate. Forgiving each other just as Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. Right? It's something that we have to do. Peace is not something we hope for, it's something we work for. Forgiving someone is not an easy thing to do. Extending grace to people that, quite frankly, don't deserve it. That's pride talking. Because you don't deserve it either. That we take that, that, that forgiveness and we share that peace that we have and we share that with other people. I'm tell you what, it's not easy. And you'd be like, Pastor Steve, I can't be a peacemaker. I'm going to go back through all the beatitudes leading up to it. Are you poor in spirit? <laughs> Do you mourn over your sins? You know, you, you can't jump to the seventh beatitude before you go through the other six. There's a process there. And so this is, this is a high one. This is, this is a high pinnacle to reach. But I know by the grace of God, we get there. Because peace is something God works through us in this world. We had a great opportunity this, this uh, last couple of days over at Celebrate Minnesota. If you were there, I mean, awesome, amazing event. Thank you to all the volunteers that came and helped. Or people just came and showed up. You know, there was a, Darren is telling the story about a neighbor across the street. He had lived there for, for years and years. And he said he's seen all kinds of events happen in, in Whitney Park. And he said, but this one was different. He goes, there's just an energy. There was a peace. There was, there was something happening there. And he said, it was just amazing. Uh, and he was touched just by that presence that someone put on that kind of an event there. And, and some of you guys were a part of that. Thank you. You were being peacemakers. I don't know if you thought about it. You're like, oh, I'm just going to help volunteer. No, you're being a peacemaker because you're bringing the love of God into a community that, that sometimes doesn't feel very loved. For those of you who, who or, or for those who were there, or those who weren't, everybody else, you know what? We can bring that love. We can bring that peace. And so my challenge to you is thinking about your love. Where is the greatest amount of discord? Where is the biggest or most broken relationship that you have? Right? Think about how can you bring peace? What's interesting about this word discord is, is, is it's actually from a, 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 a musical term, discord, like a disharmony chord, right? Like if our instruments were out of tune up here, you guys were like, you know, it doesn't sound good, right? That's what conflict is like. If you think of it in musical terms, it's, it's when those notes aren't working together. But as a church, as the family of God, when we're at peace, it doesn't mean that we're always doing exactly the same things. What it means is that we are in harmony, Right? I don't know if you've, you've thought about harmonies or, or chords that are played, that the, the, the notes play off each other, and that's when the beautiful and amazing music comes through. And when people go, oh man, it's like angels were singing, right? You've heard that, that thought before. God is here. Yeah, when, when people see that, when people see in the church, the family of God harmonized doing things like we did at Celebrate Minnesota, you know, the world's going to go, wow, they take up. They, they notice. I said, man, 
These people must be of God because people of the world don't act this way. I want to encourage you, you can do that. You don't have to do that to be a child of God. If you take a look at 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And as that is what we are, we are the children of God. God has called us into that position. Now, as we go here with the peace that God has given to us to be able to be peacemakers, we can show the world what the children of God actually look like because of God's grace, God's love. That's the way in which we can make a big difference in this world with God's peace that he has first given to us in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen.